This is the Roland SH4D tabletop synthesizer that is currently battery powered on my desk at the moment. In this video, I'm gonna to try to help you decide whether or not you should or should not consider this synth in your studio or your workflow in general. So there's a lot to like about this box. I definitely wanna clarify that before I talk about the nitpicky type of stuff because there's also a lot that I don't like about it. And there's a lot of things that I feel like maybe were oversights or design shortcomings based on what they had to work with with the software and all that. Like I said, let's talk about the pros. So there's a ton of sounds in this box. It comes with a bunch of models. I think it's like nine models. Let me double check. There's 11 models from the SH-101 right here to the Juno 106. Then you got this SH-4D, which has four different oscillators. You got a SH-3D, which has three oscillators plus an additional LFO because all these have a dedicated LFO, but then if you want an additional LFO, you need to use something like the SH3D, sync, cross FM, ring, uh, wavetable, chord, draw drawing is interesting. Like you actually draw your waveform. I don't know how useful it is really, but you know, it's cool. Uh, and then also the PCM sounds. So like piano sounds. Some really good variety in there. There's quite a bit of sonic palette. There's four parts plus a rhythm. So you have essentially four part multi-timbral plus a rhythm section that is very different from the, the regular oscillator. And the way this is laid out is you have essentially access to whatever part you have selected on the surface here plus effects. I'll be honest, it's a little confusing. And not because I'm like having a tough time grasping it or anything like that. I've made some beats with it and I like what I've done with it, but the way it juggles menus and juggles context based on what you have selected is actually really confusing. So for instance, we have part one selected right here. So you have to hold shift and I have part one uh, selected, which is this currently JD piano. And that means that this oscillator section, it will reflect what's happening here for this part. And then also the filter, which the filter sounds really good by the way. And I should mention this is all digital, it's all software, and it's also based on the the Zencore engine. It's not a Zencore product, which is weird, but it's all, it's like the same software. So we'll get more to that in a bit. Filter, and then ADSR for the filter. Also drive, which is nice. See a lot of sonic potential, you know? By the way, the drive is after the high pass filter and then goes into the cutoff. So if you're curious about that, which it's not reflective on the filter panel right here. Then you have the amp circuit with uh, the ADSR right there, also pan and level to adjust for the actual tone. And then the LFO, dedicated LFO that can adjust uh, pitch, filter, amp type of stuff. Pretty straightforward for a panel layout. But again, in terms of context, this stuff switches and changes and gets a little confusing. For instance, if you press pattern, Suddenly these faders become levels for the parts, but if you want to adjust the rhythm part, you have to do timber right here. Part R, rhythm, volume is adjusted with timber. It's like, okay, that's kind of your first clue that maybe not everything was fully thought out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to like mean any disrespect to the designers or anything like that because obviously designing a box like this with the constraints is difficult So I don't want to knock that side of what this is offering. I'm just I want to reflect as a user I feel a lot of things don't necessarily line up and make sense for how it's presented In fact the whole rhythm section in general Feels almost tacked on just just a little bit tacked on so like for instance you hold shift press rhythm for your rhythm part. And then all of these, the button keyboard down here becomes all the different instruments for the rhythm kit, which is cool. Also, I, I like that. With each one of these, I have to take off pattern by the way, with each one of these, you have access to the rhythm engine and there's the various PCM slash modeled type of stuff that's in here that you have access to. So you don't have access to the drive though, that becomes unavailable for any of these. But each one of these sounds does have filter. See, so this filter can be different to this, which is nice, right? You know, good amount of flexibility right there. Again, it just feels a little tacked on to the whole experience because it's like there's these four faders that tell you like four parts, four faders, got it. And then this rhythm section that is like, okay. But it, it's cool though. Like I, I like what I've made with it. In fact, here, I'll play you something. So I'm gonna go pattern. I'm gonna hold the page button to select different page stuff, which actually I'm already in three because that's where I was putting my stuff. Uh, and then you can choose uh, which pattern to play. Like, let's do one. So that's got a lot of like lo-fi effect going on, a lot of pumping, compression, which uh, I, I like. Uh, get this guy.
So I like the sounds I'm getting out of this box. Also, it's fully portable. This is all being run on a battery right now. Quick criticism, I don't know how much battery I have left. Supposedly in the manual, it said that when it gets low, it'll flash and tell me that there's low battery. But as of right now, I have I don't know where the batteries are. So this could die in the middle of this uh, video, uh, which is no problem. I can just plug it in. But it's just one of those things where it's like, why wasn't there a battery indicator put in this? And that's probably going to come down the road also. Roland has been pretty good about updating their stuff. Quick note, if you want to help out the channel and you're considering buying the SH4D or any music gear in general, if you use our affiliate links at Zounds, then it greatly helps out the channel. Zounds is our affiliate of choice, and we've been using them for years. So if you pick up gear through our links, then it helps out the channel. So thank you very much. Back to the rhythm type of stuff. You can definitely get some really cool sounds out of this. And in a previous video, I actually hooked this up to the DigiTact and I basically treated it like a tone box and I really liked what I got out of it. I need to get out of pattern mode. So I press the pattern button. Now I'm out of pattern mode and I'm in back into part mode. And I'm in part one because you can tell by the, the number right here, it says one. So that tells me part one, got it. Okay, so back to the models here. Like I said, there's a lot of really cool models to work with from the PCM type of stuff to uh, SH-101. So if you want like an SH-101 and a Juno 106 plus some additional stuff kind of built in a box that you have some hands-on control with, this actually does a really great job. I believe the filter is different. It's a different modeled filter or something that's custom for this box. I could be wrong on that and I apologize if I am. So it's not a one-to-one -one re recreation specifically, but it sounds good. When I'm in SH-101, if I press the sound button, it does not bring me to the model. As you can see right here, it says preset SH-4D. So this is the 4D stuff still. So I have to press over right here to go to different uh, models. Here's sync. Here's the SH-101. Holy pad. the idea on that uh, than the Juno. Let's actually take the sound and do a little affecting. So I got this Juno model here. I can do some some wobbling. Cool stuff, right? Throw some drive in there. One thing that I don't know currently is where settings are when I'm affecting a tone. And so I loaded up this accordion tone and I have no idea where the drive was. I have no idea where the filter was or anything like that. And I don't think there's any visual feedback that tells me about that stuff. Cool. So I like how uh, dirty that sounds. In order to add some reverb to this, you have to understand the effects structure. And it's actually pretty simple once you understand it, but the way it's laid out, I think is confusing. You have these buttons here. Whenever buttons are lined up like this, they feel like they have equal value for what they're changing on here, but they don't because the reverb, chorus, and delay are send effects. And then the tone effect is for the actual part that you're affecting. And the multi effect, the MFX, is for the overall scene or the pattern, I should say, because it's patterns in here. But if you've used a Jupiter X or a Juno X, then it's scene. <laughs> So it's confusing. I understand it completely now. If I want to add some reverb to this, I press reverb and then I start twisting control one and it tells me reverb send. Great, right? And then control two controls how much time of the reverb. 
Now again, this is a send, so it's gonna be global. So anything that gets reverb or you send reverb to it is gonna share the same reverb algorithm in here. That's, that's pretty straightforward. Now, if you want to adjust the actual reverb itself, you hold shift and you press reverb and then you have the type. So let's go, uh, so Integra 7 or wormhole. I like a wormhole. And then I can go the time, we'll adjust the time and make it, you know, I don't know, eight seconds. So it's all ambient-ish. Diffusion, 100%, yes. There's a pre-low pass, high pass. Let's get the high pass up so it's not as much bass. Not bad. I think that works. I'll press exit. So now that reverb is baked into whatever pattern I'm currently in, which is 3-04. However, if I... Oh man, I just did it. If I press it again, it reloads that pattern, which I guess that makes sense from a design perspective. This is one of my criticisms for sure. Actually, I was watching uh, Ricky Tinez's video. I completely agree with him. It's so weird that you have to constantly save if you don't want to lose any of your progress. Anyways, let's get back to where I was here. So I was in the Juno right here. I was in the accordion, which it remembered. Threw a little drive on there. Okay. I believe we're, we're back to where we were. So if I don't want to lose whatever I'm doing, I have to constantly go in and save. I'd have to go shift and then write because, you know, right's right here. And then there's overwrite, and then there's pattern and tone, and then pattern, and then whatever else has been edited. I always just go pattern and tone, and then it'll want to save whatever you have edited to a new user tone section. So I just go, yeah, sure, save it, yes, yes. <laughs> just like what Ricky was doing, like, you know, save, 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 save. I mean, it's re really weird that you have to do that every time. So now, if I come back to this pattern, this is saved for future use. Effects, that's where I was going with this before I got sidetracked by the pattern saving. Sends on reverb, chorus, and delay. If I press chorus, now I can create the send. Which sounds awesome, by the way. Like, like I said, the sounds are great in this machine. Delay, I'll adjust how much send and what type of delay note. That sounds cool, right? I mean, it's dripping with effects, totally, but I think the overall sound and the, the feeling and vibe is great. Now I have one more effect that I can work with for this tone before it goes then to like the multi effects for the overall sound of the whole pattern. So if I press tone, now I'm working with a effect that is only for part one, which is currently selected. Once again, reverb, chorus, delay, those are sends to the pattern, and then tone is per part. All right, and there's also a tone effect for the rhythm part as well, so you can add some nice crunchy lo-fi effect to your drums. So let's see what this is currently. If I hold shift, press tone, it tells me. It's uh, the lo-fi effect, actually. It's a phonograph effect. Let's change it. Hit shift it. Oh, that's loud. You can also set this to through so you don't have an effect on there if you don't want it. You got like equalizer, mid-side, spectrum, isolator too. Interesting. Probably similar to the SP404 isolator. Super filter. Yeah, a lot of cool stuff. I'm gonna go back to the lo-fi. In the lo-fi you have lo-fi compressor, bit crusher, phonograph, and that's it. And they're cool. Now here is a gripe that I have with this box. Anything that is cool in the effects, basically you have to dive into the menu right here. It's not very obvious what you're getting out of this. Like lo-fi type is five. By the way, I should look in here on the manual. It tells me what this stuff is. Lo-fi type degrades the sound quality. The quality grows poorer as this value is increased. So the problem with that description is there's clearly some bit and sample rate reduction going on. And I, I just don't know how much is going on in there. So it's one of these things where it's like, all right, I just, I'll trust that I like number five. Cool. 
<laughs> Anyways, it's a little gripe on my end. But you do have additional control and flexibility on this. You know, like post filter type of stuff, cut off on that. Maybe brighten it up a bit. Or darken it. Anyways, that's pretty cool. So obviously I'm not gonna go through all the multi effects that you can do for the tone or even the whole pattern because it's just way too much and this video would be forever long. But to show you the sonic capability with the effects is very deep, really cool stuff. And that's just one part. You know, I could do all four parts plus the rhythm section getting its own tone and obviously sending reverb and all that stuff. And I believe you can send reverb to individual parts also on the rhythm. So for instance, so let's have reverb. Yeah, but the kick is dry. So each one of these rhythm instruments, they can all have individual sends for this, but I believe the tone is the same. The it's Yeah, the tone is kit based. Each one of these don't get individual tones, but the whole kit by and large gets it, which is actually great because then you can send a lo-fi compressor, which is totally what I would do. Awesome. <laughs> you can really tell it's got some more vibe. What you can do though, is decide if these instruments get sent to the multi effects. I think I go shift tone. There it is. It's one of these things that don't fully line up with the design. Tone is for the four parts, but rhythm is like different. But if I want to actually adjust the kit, I have to go shift tone. <laughs> Anyways, so in here you have the rhythm kit edit, and then you can adjust each one of these voices for what's in here. So a little more granular detail, but here you can assign the uh, the output. So I can tell it to not go through the multi effects. Dry multi effects. Okay, I'm gonna go back to part one and I wanna round out the discussion on the effects because <laughs> it's gotten a bit long. The final one is multi effects. Obviously you select it and then you have control over effects pattern wide which is useful if you want to strap a compressor across everything like those previous patterns that i played in fact i'll play them right now heavily using the multi-effect so i just turned off the multi-effect turn it back on let's hear it on this one off Multi-effects on the pattern can do a lot of heavy lifting. And guess what? I usually go to a lo-fi for me personally. But I mean, any of these effects can also be the, the multi-effect for the pattern. Lo-fi compressor. Which is now too loud. So now what's happening is this Juno is getting hit by the tone multi-effect, which is, yeah, lo-fi. Oh, it's a phonograph, right, because it didn't save. <laughs> so it's getting reverb, chorus, delay. Actually, I don't think it's getting this chorus anymore. Maybe it was, can't remember. And then the tone, and then the phonograph on here. And then it's also getting the multi-effects lo-fi compressor. So that's really cool, right? And I'm gonna throw on the visual arpeggio real quick because I think this will be interesting with it. We're gonna go bubble. Put the gravity up, put the speed. Now I'm gonna put the release up, sustain up.
think that's really fun. It's not exactly useful in the context of the sequencer, unfortunately. <laughs> but I think in terms of sound design and just having some creativity, I think that visual arpeggiator is really cool. It's also weird that it's just buried in the menu. You can't access it from the arpeggio side right here. At least I don't think. You press this. There's nothing about the visual arpeggio. You have to go shift, menu, and then go into the visual arpeggio to actually turn it on. And then as soon as you leave it, the visual arpeggio goes away. I think it's one of the cool features in this, and it's like buried. Weird. Okay, I've spent a lot of time in the effects. I wanted to highlight what's possible with it, because it's very powerful with the whole lo-fi effects and different, you know, the 90 plus effects and the fact it goes tone and then the whole pattern and all that stuff. It really goes to show you that there's a lot of tonal capabilities in this box if you treat it as a tone box specifically. Like if you want this to be a synth that you trigger from another machine, like say an MPC-1, it actually works out really well that way. If you just treat it as one part, then all these panel buttons really kind of become useful in that sense. Like you can, you can adjust it. When you have multiple parts going in one pattern, you get less of that control and flexibility. So this four part type of setup allows you to make some pretty complex patterns and have it right on your lap on the couch. So you can be making ideas, making beats, basically anywhere. And it's also really small too. I don't know if it's obvious, but here, here's an OP-1. Obviously the OP-1 is smaller, you know, considerably smaller. But if you've ever held an OP-1, the OP-1 is tiny in comparison. Another one is the DigiTact right here. DigiTact is smaller. It's also heavier and there's no battery inside the DigiTact. And then here is an MPC-1 just for comparison. MPC-1 is a bit bigger overall. But what I'm trying to say is that for the real estate, it's actually pretty convenient. It's nice, compact, and doesn't feel super heavy. You could easily throw this in your backpack and have a nice portable tabletop type of synth for you. And the buttons feel really good too. I really appreciate the, the Zencore high resolution type of stuff. Like you can see on here, this goes all the way up to 1023. On the Juno X, it also feels really good when you're sweeping the filter. So all those things are excellent quality of life type of stuff. Where this falls flat for me personally is in the sequencer side of things. So there's no micro timing. There's no nudging off the beat. Everything is always quantized. There's no click. If you want to record something, you don't get like a pre-roll type of thing. And also it immediately starts recording no matter what. So you hold shift and press start. It's now recording and goes immediately. And as you can see, I have no idea what type of uh, click or, you know, like I can't hear a tempo to it. So if I want to do that, I always have to go into rhythm. And let's just put a four to the floor. So I have a little frame of reference here. And then I could start putting some stuff in. Before I do that though, I'm gonna go shift edit on the pattern. It says I'm in part one, I'm gonna change it to 32 steps. If you hold shift, you get 16 step variations, which is nice. So we do 32 steps. So I have a little pattern here. And you can also record some filter sweep stuff as well, but it's a little weird, so I'll do it. That sounds great, right? What if I grab this? It's constantly fighting it. It's weird. It actually sounds cool when you're doing it. I'd actually be into that sound specifically, but if I don't want that sound, then I'd find it extremely annoying that it's constantly doing that. I'm going to save this real quick because, of course, it's probably going to get overwritten if I switch something. So there's no click, there's no micro timing, everything is always quantized. Obviously, you can add swing and stuff like that, and you do have note probability, which uh, let's go back to the rhythm part to show this. So. So let's throw a little off hats here. So let's say I want this one to happen every now and then. So you have velocity and you also have gate, and then you have probability, and I don't know what the S means, but it's basically like subdivision type of stuff. Actually, I guess it's subdivision. <laughs> That's what it means. So probability, we can drop this down to say 50%, and then when it plays, it'll be a quarter.
right? Let's turn it off. Turn the velocity down. dug into the sequencer I actually found myself preferring to have a different sequencer hooked up like an MPC-1 or a Digitact. Digitact I could send four different notes per channel to all the parts and also trigger rhythm parts as well on a different MIDI channel. So as a tone box the SH-40 is actually really cool when hooked up to another sequencer especially the MPC because it's very powerful sequencer so you can do a lot of complex things not worry about any kind of polyphony issues. And by the way, I didn't mention this has 60 note polyphony, which sounds like a lot, but when you take into consideration the Zen core technology, each partial of a model is considered a voice. So for instance, in this SH-40 model, I believe all these parts are considered individual oscillators. This is playing four notes. <laughs> And it's a little misleading, honestly. It's the same thing in like the Juno X and the Jupiter and all that. They say this many voices, but there's a catch, some caveats to it. So for me, I actually prefer more powerful sequencers in general. But if you're looking for like an old school style sequencer, then this is technically more in that old school style. You know, it's more like a an actual hardware sequencer built into a synthesizer. The lines start getting blurred right there because there's four parts. It's four part multi-timbral plus a rhythm section. So it's like the SH-40 is becoming more of a, a full-on groove box, but yet it's still limited and feels more like a traditional synthesizer sequencer. It's kind of a dichotomy. Like the more powerful these boxes get, the more questions that arise that say, well, why didn't you add this? Or why didn't you have this type of thing? Or why not have like a sample thing in there? Because you can have voices be based on samples and all that. Obviously the designers have to draw the line somewhere and what, what they add to it. Not having micro timing in the step sequencer feels really strange. This is a powerful box at that point with a lot of tone possibilities, but it can't do simple things like adjust the snare offbeat just a little bit. Now, because it's software, it is more than likely going to get updates in the future. Some of my criticisms could definitely change and shift over time. But as an initial release, there's a lot of it that leaves me wondering why. At least from my perspective, I feel like there's a lot of things that just feel like they were built with the thought that we have this predefined software and we need to put it into a box somehow. <laughs> <laughs> this is just my perspective on it and how I'm feeling about it. Because I'm pretty sure it's all the same stuff that's in the Juno X and maybe even the Jupiter X. It's just tweaked and adjusted. Scenes are patterns. Parts and tones are the same. And there is a rhythm section in the Juno X and the Jupiter X. There is no sequencer like this inside the Juno X. So you can't sequence the four parts that you have in there. But you can load up different Zen Core models on the G Juno X. You can't load up Zen Core models on this because it's not considered a Zen Core instrument. But it's clearly built on that technology. The LED or LCD screen is the same as the Juno X on here uh, and same type of navigation type of stuff. The oscillators have these four parts and there's just a lot of similarities. So you can clearly see that the software was existing beforehand and then Roland decided to put that software into a box that's more compact and tabletop friendly. And they've done that pretty well. Like I said, it's a great standalone battery operated tabletop synth in that regard. One thing that I find annoying with Roland synthesizers right now currently, and even their Phantom as well, is that there's no support for iOS devices. Now I get it, if you're not a iPad user or an iPhone user, it doesn't matter, then whatever. But there is a workflow that could exist that would be really freaking cool with this if it supported it. Now imagine you could plug in just one USB cable into the SH4D and then plug it into the iPad Pro and you would have audio back and forth, you'd have all, I think it's like six stereo channels from uh, the SH4D into the iPad Pro. That would be amazing. It does not work that way. You have to have proprietary drivers loaded up in order to get the audio features out of the USB side of things. For Mac and Windows, 
you have to install custom drivers that will then enable that ability. Now, other synth companies have made it, so you don't have to do that. Like, I believe Yamaha specifically has the ability to generically support that ability through generic USB, MIDI, and audio type of features. And Roland has not decided to do that. I'm not an engineer, so I don't know what reasons they, they have for that particular thing. Maybe it has to do with their proprietary cloud type of stuff, so people can't just send stuff back and forth. Actually, that's probably what it is. But in this particular situation, the SH4D is not a Zen Core instrument, but it's built on that technology, which means that it can't hook up to an iPad or an iPhone. Because again, just imagine, so you record this stuff on your iPad, you get some ideas down, you know, you're messing with the uh, the SH4D, maybe you're using the D-Motion, and then you save that to the GarageBand and it uploads to the cloud, and then you get home, you can load it up on your computer and pull that stuff into, say, Logic Pro or something like that. That would be an awesome workflow. So that's not possible, obviously, as I've stated. There is no iOS support, and it's the same for the Juno X and the Jupyter X, and also the Phantom as well. You know, if you have like a Windows tablet, then obviously you can install the drivers and kind of get that experience. Let's talk about the D-Motion real quick. I think it's interesting, but not very useful and mainly because you have to have cables plugged into your device to use it <laughs> so if you put the d-motion on and then you're you fly into navigating with the d-motion i don't think it's very useful maybe that'll change with future stuff i don't know you could technically control other synthesizers sending the output out of the midi into other stuff to pick up a tabletop synth and move it around but i don't find it very useful at all i find the visual arpeggio more useful which can take advantage of it go into this bounce and then this will tilt the pads yay strange decisions from a design point of view there's also no editor on the computer which this thing could definitely use an editor if you wanted to see everything that's going on inside of it. The sound design side of it is definitely limited. There's not a lot of like modulation routings that you can do. Don't expect it to be a design powerhouse by any means. Like the Mini Freak or the Hydrosynth or the Mini Log XD are all going to be more powerful for sound design than this box. But this does have four part flexibility and a sequencer built in and it can run on a battery and it can fit in your backpack easily and you can pull it out anywhere essentially. But you can't hook it up to your phone and record things directly from the USB. <laughs> It's such a, oh, would have been so cool to do that. Anyways, I should wrap up this review. I personally will not be keeping the SH4D. I think it really could fit some people's workflows though. Like if you need something that is small with lots of sounds that can be on your lap or very portable, like this really does a good job of that. I think the sequencer has a lot to be desired and I think the actual workflow, confusing, and the whole having to save constantly is a, a bummer. They need to change that in the software. They need to make it more closer to what the DigiTact has where you can save and reload pattern type of stuff. So anything that you're doing on a particular pattern will save in like a temporary memory. And then you, if you wanna officially commit it, you hit the, the write and overwrite it. I think that would be significantly better for this box. But yeah, what do you think? Drop some comments below, I'll definitely check them out. If you do plan on picking up the SH4D or if you plan on picking up any synths or music gear in general, if you use our affiliate links at Zounds, it greatly helps out the channel. So thank you very much if you do that. A like and subscribe obviously is greatly appreciated. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time. Peace.